there should be no law against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but There's hell, hell, you restrict somebody from it, they're gonna want to be. We found our victim, and sad as it may be, she's our friend. But you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie's daughter. She's going to be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. When legendary horror director Wes Craven released the teen slasher movie, Scream, in 1996, he probably had no idea how successful it was going to become, spawning a franchise that has grossed over $600 million in revenue. The plot after all, is hardly original. A group of high school students is terrorized by a masked killer who stalks and kills them one by one. When the murderer's identity is eventually revealed, he turns out to be not one, but two of their classmates, working together. Director Craven has admitted that the story was inspired by the real crimes of notorious serial killer Danny Rowling, alias the Gainesville Ripper. What is less well-known is that the movie itself inspired a particularly bloody murder. But before continuing we welcome you to our channel The Murder Files where we discuss the most breathtaking, terrifying and strange true crime stories and also we would like to send our sympathies to loved ones and families who fell victim to the obnoxious crimes presented on this channel. In the town of Pocatello, Idaho, two seemingly ordinary 16-year-olds named Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik attended Pocatello High School. While Brian had recently relocated from Utah with his family, Tori had lived in the region his entire life. Due to their shared love of movies, particularly horror films, the two quickly became close friends. After graduating, Tori actually planned to enroll in film school with the goal of directing movies. He was almost never seen without his video camera because he frequently recorded impromptu interviews with his classmates as well as random footage. Of the two, Tori was the more popular among his peers, Brian the more introverted. They did, however, share a few acquaintances, most notably Cassie Jo Stoddart and her partner Matt Beckham. Cassie was a junior at Pocatello High School, just like Brian and Tori, and she and Matt got along well with the boys. Cassie was unaware that Brian and Tori were plotting a massacre with her as the target victim, which she could not have foreseen. Where exactly this diabolical scheme had its genesis is difficult to fathom. Following the incident, Brian and Tori would each attempt to place responsibility on the other by claiming innocence. However, there is a sizable amount of evidence that points to their shared guilt. Tori's infatuation with slasher films and Brian's adoration for the Columbine High School shooters Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. For those who don't know Columbine shooting took place on the 20th of April 1999 where two high school students Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold opened fire on the whole school killing 15 in total and injuring nearly 24. The morbid fascination undoubtedly brought out the worst in one another. What is known is that they started filming video recordings in the months preceding the massacre, whereby they openly articulated their ideology and their aspirations to become serial killers. They discussed the killers who they admire, dismissing Ted Bundy, who has confessed to at least 36 murders in the Hillside Stranglers as amateurs, and honing in on Ed Gain as the ideal. And perhaps most chillingly, they describe the killing spree that they are going to carry out, talking about the time they've spent staking out potential victims and honing in eventually on Cassie Jo Stoddard and Matt Beckham. She's perfect, so she's gonna die. 
Right, and we're gonna call a, a girl, a guy named Cassie and Matt. They're our, our friends, but we have to make sacrifices, so. Um, I feel tonight it is the night, and it feels really weird, it, you know, it's happening snow week and stuff, and I feel like I wanna kill somebody. Uh, I know that's not normal, you know, but what the hell. That particular clip that you just saw was recorded on September 21st, 2006. By then, Draper and Adamchik's plans for the murder were already well evolved. Three weeks earlier, Adamchik had called an 18-year-old friend named Joe Lucero and asked if he would buy some knives for him. Lucero had agreed, and the two of them, together with Draper, had gone to a local pawn shop and purchased four hunting knives for $45. That since Cassie Jo Stoddard's parents were at home on September 21st, the murder would not occur. The following day, September 22, 2006, Cassie Jo Stoddard was due to house sit at her uncle's residence on Whispering Cliffs Drive. When Cassie invited them to hang out with her and Matt that evening at school, Adam Chick and Draper learned about their plans. One unassuming but ultimately terrifying clip can be found in Adam Chick's video journal entry for that day. It depicts Cassie in the school corridor standing in front of her locker. Within 12 hours of that segment being filmed, Cassie Jo Stoddard would be brutally slain by the youth behind the camera and his warped cohort. Adam Chick and Draper arrived at the Whispering Cliffs residence at around 7 p.m. on the evening of Friday, September 22. They spent around two hours chatting and joking with the two young people they intended killing. Then at around 9, Adam Chick abruptly announced that they had to leave. Some 15 minutes later, the power at the home went out. Because of her fear, Cassie asked Matt if he could spend the night. Matt then called his parents to request permission to stay the night. But his mother refused, stating that she would still pick him up at 10.30 as planned. The electricity had been restored by the time she did so, and Cassie was beginning to feel a little less apprehensive. She had no idea that Draper and Adamchik had tampered with the power supply and that they were currently hidden in the shadows and keeping watch on the house. After Matt Beckham left, the lights went out again about 30 minutes later. This time, the killers creeped nearer while holding their brand new blades. Cassie Jo Stoddard's body was not discovered until her uncle and his family returned home on Sunday evening and walked in on a bloodbath. The later autopsy would show the murder's actual awful scope. 30 stab wounds were found on Cassie, with 12 of them being deemed possibly lethal. The pathologist also discovered that two weapons, one with a serrated edge and the other without, had been used in the assault. This was a crucial piece of evidence given the defense the murderers would soon put forward. And tracking down those killers would be a relatively straightforward task. After Matt Beckham revealed that Draper and Adamchik had been at the house on the night of the murder, they were questioned as potential witnesses. However, their answers to questions asked by investigators soon roused suspicion, and before long, they were elevated to the head of the suspect list. Both, however, insisted that they knew nothing about the murder. According to them, they'd gone to a local movie theater to watch a film called Pulse. Even though neither appeared to have the faintest concept of what the movie was truly about, they were able to present ticket stubs. Draper modified his story after being exposed for that falsehood. Now, he claimed, he and Adamchik had made a deal to use the movie as a defense. In reality, they had been breaking into cars. Investigators were immediately alerted by this revelation. They knew from experience that criminals almost never confess to a crime unless it's to hide a more serious one. Furthermore, Draper claimed to have been operating in an area where there had been no complaints of automobiles being broken into. 
the detectives put greater pressure on Draper and Adamchik because they were more convinced than ever that they were lying. Draper was the one who broke first. On Wednesday, September 27, 2006, he acknowledged in the course of his third interview that he and Adamchik had returned to the residence after Beckham had departed. He claimed that they had entered through a door that they had earlier in the evening purposefully left unlocked. According to Draper, their intention had been to give Cassie a scare. Then, though, Adamchik pulled out a knife and began stabbing Cassie. Draper admits to stabbing Cassie in the leg and chest after originally denying that he had injured her. He claimed that the only reason he did it was because Adamchik had threatened to murder him if he didn't. Draper also agreed to show police where he and Adamchik had disposed of the murder weapons and, later that afternoon, led a contingent of detectives and crime scene investigators to a location at Black Rock Canyon. Here several items were recovered, including bloodstained clothing, latex gloves, three daggers and a Sony videotape. Particularly telling, however, was a segment apparently filmed directly after the murder. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, I just killed Cassie. Oh, oh fuck. I felt like. Oh, I mean, it went by so fast. Shut the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. Okay. Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik were tried separately for the murder of Cassie Jo Stoddard. At trial, each of them attempted to shift the blame to the other and to portray himself as having been coerced to participate in the murder. The juvenile killers were both found guilty and received identical sentences, life in prison without the possibility of parole. They are currently incarcerated at the Idaho State Correctional Institution near Kuna, Idaho. Appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court by both killers have been denied.